China has a dollar shortage, and it's becoming a big problem. Who can solve this economic crisis? Welcome back to China Uncensored. I'm Chris Chappell. The almighty dollar. No one can get enough of it, especially China. Yes, China has a dollar problem, or more specifically, a dollar shortage. They say mo money, mo problems, but in China's case, it's less money, also mo problems. They just have a lot of problems. And one of the problems is that China is running out of U.S. dollars. And that's a big deal, because the U.S. dollar is still the dominant global currency. The U.S. dollar is stable and easily traded across borders, kind of like Mexican Coke. No, Seamus, you know what I meant. Thank you. Anyway, 50% of existing international trade invoices, cross-border loans, and international bonds are in U.S. dollars. And more than 40% of international payments are made in U.S. dollars. China uses U.S. dollars for a lot of its own international trade and investment, even when that trade and investment has nothing to do with the United States. Here's an example. The Belt and Road Initiative. It's the Chinese Communist Party's flagship global investment and infrastructure project. Depending on who you ask, it's also a Trojan horse of debt trap diplomacy. But even the Belt and Road needs U.S. dollars. That's because contractors have typically preferred dollars in exchange for their work building the roads, bridges, ports, and more of the initiative. And that means Chinese banks have to finance these Belt and Road projects in U.S. dollars. These countries are basically saying, we welcome Chinese investment as long as you give it to us in American money. Well, that's awkward. They really shouldn't look a Trojan gift horse in the mouth. Or maybe they should, because then they'd see all of the Greek soldiers hiding inside. Anyway, this isn't Troy uncensored. So why is there a dollar shortage in China? Back in 2015, there was a huge stock market crash in China, followed by an economic slowdown. China was forced to use up $1 trillion of its foreign reserves to prop up their currency, the yuan. Basically, China's central bank had to sell a lot of dollars to prevent its own currency from crashing. And now, China needs more U.S. dollars than ever. That's because over the last few years, Chinese banks and some Chinese companies have been borrowing heavily in dollars. That's known as dollar-denominated debt. It means that investors pay for these Chinese-issued bonds in U.S. dollars, and eventually, they'll get paid back in dollars, too. Assuming the Chinese companies ever pay them back. This kind of borrowing is an easy, short-term way to get dollars into China, which is one reason why China's foreign-owned debt has exploded in the last few years. Chinese banks have more than $800 billion of foreign currency loans on their books. And outside of banks, other Chinese companies owe even more. They have $2 trillion in debt to foreigners, according to official data, plus another $650 billion in debt through subsidiaries overseas. Which means they have U.S. dollars now, but at some point, they need to repay those loans in U.S. dollars. Chinese companies are looking at $120 billion of debt repayment this year on their U.S. dollar-denominated debt. And if those companies can't easily get dollars, paying back the loans could be painful. I know just how these companies feel. Having to repay huge loans. Stupid NYU master's degree. Oh. And you know what doesn't help those firms repay loans? The fact that Chinese banks are running out of dollars. A lot of Chinese companies just aren't repaying their loans. U.S. dollar bond defaults by Chinese firms have jumped threefold to $12 billion so far this year. There have also been external stresses that have made China's dollar shortage worse. And those external stresses come from the United States. At this point, just looking at Donald Trump makes them stressed. 
And that's, of course, because of the U.S.-China trade war. Last year, the trade war forced Chinese officials to weaken the U.N. against the dollar. It also made it harder for China to earn dollars from exports to the U.S. And as I mentioned in a previous episode about why the Chinese elite are screwed, U.S. sanctions could cut Chinese banks off from U.S. dollar transactions. And that could effectively cut China off from the global financial system. In the worst case scenario, if China runs out of dollars, it means they can't buy resources they need to keep their economy going. For example, Chinese firms relied on the U.S. dollars they earned to pay for needed raw materials and technology for making their manufactured goods. But things haven't gone to that point yet. And if it were really an emergency, the Chinese Communist Party could tap into their $3.1 trillion of foreign reserves. But they won't do that unless things get really bad, because doing that could also wreck their own currency. But just in case you were feeling sorry for the Chinese Communist Party, don't worry, because Chinese state-run media isn't worried. And that's because a hero is here to save the day. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Corona-chan. Well, that was unexpected. Why is Corona Chan the Chinese Communist Party's unlikely hero? I'll tell you why after this short break. Welcome back. Corona Chan, villain or hero? Well, the first thing she did this year was deal a savage blow to China's economy. The economy tanked so badly that even the Chinese Communist Party couldn't pretend it was still growing. But the good news for the party is that the coronavirus dealt an even more savage blow to the rest of the world's economy. Hey, if the Chinese Communist Party can't win by rising above everyone else, it can still win by pulling everyone else down. China's exports, for example, are now doing better than they were last year, partly because other exporting countries remain paralyzed by the pandemic. The coronavirus also affected the U.S. economy by weakening the U.S. dollar. And that has led to the strongest Chinese yuan against the dollar in a long time. Which is great for all those Chinese companies that have to pay back their debts in U.S. dollars. Thank you, Corona Chan. But even though Corona Chan has partially saved the day for the Chinese Communist Party by reversing a lot of the pressure on China's economy, she's not the biggest hero here. There's someone else who's the savior of the Chinese economy. Someone who comes through for China time and time again. The most dependable, truest sucker, I mean friend, to the Chinese Communist Party. It's the foreign investor. Foreign investors are like innocent children wandering through the woods and stumbling across a house made out of candy. And by candy, I mean Chinese bonds that promise high interest rates. Yes, foreign investors are flocking to China's bond market, spurred by fears of missing out. Look, if all the other foreign investors jumped off a bridge, would you jump too? Of course you would. There might be candy at the bottom. China is even creating new rules that make it easier for foreign investors to buy mainland bonds. So China is opening up their bond markets to foreign investors just when they need lots of dollars that foreign investors can provide. How convenient. And foreign investors are very interested because it looks like an easy way to make higher returns on their money. And they're being egged on by positive news articles about Chinese bonds. The Chinese bond market is a standout. China's bond market really shines. Chinese bonds are a safe place for investors to hide. Don't do it, foreign investors. Don't go in the house. It's not a safe place to hide. Remember how earlier I said a lot of Chinese companies are simply not repaying their debts? No? You forgot? Foreign investors seem to have forgotten too. And that's why they're flocking to the house made of money candy. Morgan Stanley estimates annual inflows of $80 billion to $120 billion into China's government bonds until 2030. Anyway, 
even if the Communist Party manages to scam foreign investors out of a few hundred billion dollars, it's not a permanent solution to China's dollar shortage. But in the short term, it is a big help, along with a weaker dollar and a weaker global economy because of Corona Chan. And if the Chinese Communist Party is ever on the edge of another financial crisis, they know who to call. And now it's time for me to answer a question from one of you, a fan who supports China Uncensored on the crowdfunding website, Patreon. Alex asks, Hi, Chris and team. Have you thought of buying any of those old Qing Dynasty or Republic of China bonds? I wonder if you could demand payment from the Taiwanese government. Well, Alex, after this episode, I'd much rather buy a Qing Dynasty Chinese bond than a CCP-backed Chinese bond. After all, there are some ethical problems with investing in China, considering the concentration camps and slave labor and Hong Kong and repression and the list goes on. Now about those Qing Dynasty and Republic of China bonds. It turns out that before 1938, the Chinese government issued trillions of dollars worth of bonds. But after the Communist Party took over, they claimed these bonds were obsolete. But there's a group based in Tennessee called the American Bondholders Foundation. They say their members hold $1.6 trillion worth of these Chinese bonds, and that China, as in the People's Republic of China, should pay. They say the PRC claims to be the sole government of all of China, including Taiwan. But at the same time, China refuses to honor its obligations to pay on the defaulted sovereign bonds, citing that they were issued by the ROC. They can't have it both ways. Here's where the story gets wild. The Chinese Communist Party actually did pay off some of those bonds, but just once. The party paid out on bonds held by British investors in 1987 as part of the Hong Kong handover deal. That was negotiated by former Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. And here's where the story gets even wilder. President Trump, U.S. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin, and U.S. Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross have met with the American Bondholders Foundation. The group is trying to convince the Trump administration to demand payment for those bonds as a way of getting leverage against Beijing. They argue that because Beijing previously paid off some of the debt, but not the rest, they are in selective default and should not be able to issue more debt until they pay up. And I totally agree. Look, the party claims Hong Kong, Xinjiang, and all of the South China Sea based on Qing Dynasty territorial rights. So, shouldn't they be on the hook for the Qing Dynasty's responsibilities, too? If not, maybe we should stop recognizing their claim to Hong Kong. Thanks for your really interesting question, Alex. And if you'd like to be like Alex, head over to patreon.com slash China Uncensored. All it takes is a dollar or two an episode. You can even set a monthly limit if you'd like so you won't be charged more than you want. And you'll get some cool perks, too. And if you can't support the show on Patreon, you can always support us by liking each episode, making sure YouTube hasn't secretly unsubscribed you, and sharing this show with your friends and family. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. See you next time.